Hello, and welcome back to Equity, TechCrunch's venture capital-focused podcast. I'm TechCrunch reporter Kate Clark, and I'm joined this week by my co-host, editor-in-chief of Crunchbase News, Alex Wilhelm. How's it going, yeah, Alex? That was that was four people. <laughs> no, who that just was got just Henry, our that. executive producer. That's <laughs> so actually one person getting four times excited <laughs> about that. I'll take it. Uh, I'm good. We are back at Disrupt. First time in Moscone North, I think. Second time in Moscone, first time in Moscone North, yeah, which doesn't yeah. really matter to probably a lot of people listening who are well, like, what is Moscone? <laughs> you do care. But I, I will say the fascinating thing is this is the, by far the biggest one I've ever seen. There's like five stages, uh, yeah. of which we're on the smallest one, I think, right now. But it's a lot of fun. And we have a special guest joining us, Charles Hudson, the founder and managing partner of Precursor Ventures. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And critically, thank you for coming back on the show because you were on, and believe it or not, June 2017 when Equity was... A baby. Three months old. I mean, it was a little yeah. tiny thing. And uh, you're one of our, I think, only our top like, three returning guests ever. So thank wow. you for uh, coming back. Thank so you. if you hear a little bit of strange noises, we are doing a live episode today. So we've got a sizable audience watching us, but otherwise... Can you hear them? Yeah, cheering along. <laughs> otherwise, it is a normal episode and we will um, follow our normal format. Yes, uh, we're kicking off with our fun fact. This is the best part of the show now. Uh, we have two. Uh, critically, Charles is a fan of the wrong football team. <laughs> he is a uh, hardcore Detroit Lions fan. Uh, a team that I had no beef with whatsoever until they beat my Eagles about 48 <laughs> minutes ago. Uh, and to bring Kate back into this, you were also you. Uh, at InQtel for four years, which is the CIA's uh, or the CIA affiliated venture capital fund. That's right. So, are you the deep state that we keep <laughs> hearing about? No comment. <laughs> no comment. And how did you end up with uh, InQtel? Like all venture jobs, it was totally random. I was in a an intern at an internet company from Internet 1.0 called Excite at Home, and my manager was the wife of the person who ran InQtel, Gilman Louie. And I was all set to move to New York and do the sort of post-college finance thing. And she pulled me aside and said, you should really go interview with my husband. He has this crazy VC firm underwritten by the CIA. I think you'll like it. And that's how it happened. So that's how you got your start in venture. That's literally that how is I got unusual. That's definitely a first. And you were there for four years. Why did you leave back in the day? I went back to business school. And it was really a position that was designed to be one of those kind of first jobs out of school, and we were kind of making it up on the fly. We didn't have a lot of junior people at InQtel, and around 2003, I got to the point where I felt like I'd sort of gone as far as I could go based on what I knew. So for business school, Stanford or Harvard? Stanford. There well, are other business schools as well. And you were just saying a minute ago before we started taping that you're actually teaching a course now at Stanford. What is the course? I'm teaching a course called Entrepreneurship from Diverse Perspectives with Fern Mandelbaum, and uh, I actually had my first class where I was the lead instructor earlier this week, and it was terrifying. I, I yeah. hate that sort of that thing. That terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's dig in. Uh, actually, we're going to kick off, uh, embarrassingly enough, with a little thing about you, because Precursor Ventures, your last fund, Fund 2, was $31 million, and you're putting together uh, what I think is called an opportunity fund of about 10 give or take. I know you can't comment on that because it's still closing. Um, I was curious about the size of it, because you're going after a, a not an SPV, but an opportunity <laughs> fund that is modest in size. And I'm curious, what was the strategy behind that? Because usually these funds are larger than that, that we see out in the market. Yeah. So what happened is when we started Precursor, the goal was to do pre-seed investing, write small checks early. The number one question we got from limited partners was, well, what are you going to do when you have a really successful company that grows and you have pro rata? A little, our first one was $15 million. A little $15 million fund is not set up to do those large pro rata. So historically, we had done SPVs to handle that excess pro rata. So we've done $3.5 million worth of SPVs across 16 different companies. And when we raised Fund 2, we had a really different base of limited partners. So our Fund 1 limited partner base was a lot of family offices and VCs at other VC funds who were really comfortable if I gave them an SPV memo. They could look at the company and make an independent decision. In Fund 2, we had a lot of institutions that don't do direct investing. So I would go to them and say, hey, we have this really amazing company. They're raising a Series B. They would say, that's fantastic. We have no idea how to underwrite that. But if you had a dedicated fund, we trust your judgment enough on the follow-ons that we would support you with that. And since it's our first time, I said, we should try to size this based on the known opportunities in the fund. And you know, we picked a fund size that I think broadly reflects what we can put to work. Please. And, uh, so you doubled the size of your debut with your second fund. Do you have plans to 
double again with your third? There is a very hard dollar cap, I believe, on our pre-seed strategy. It's somewhere around $50 million. Okay, so you, you probably will not exceed $50 million with any fund. no plans to exceed $50 million whenever we raise our next fund. But what about when pre-seed deals are $5 million? This is my greatest fear, Kate, which is I live through the cycle at Seed. I tease people all the time when I was at Uncork, when I first started in 2011, a big seed round was a million dollars. And if you were Times have changed. Oh, yeah. And uh, I've seen four, four plus million dollar pre launch seed rounds in my inbox this week from very credible founders. This week? This week. That's insane. So I take it then, looking at the broader seed market as a whole, things are still very, very hot, very active. Um, I mean, we did a, a thing at Demo Day with YC, and yeah. the activity was, I mean, insane. Like, everyone was there, super packed, tons of people, and, and that's... Right, and the valuations, I mean, so Charles and I had a panel today. We talked about how to raise VC, and I remember you said valuations are typically uh, five posts, 10 to 12, sorry, yeah. 10 to 12 posts, five pre? Or what yeah, so for us, for our pre-seed companies, typical median is probably five pre call okay. it for our seed rounds though it's probably closer to 12 pre is the median right and if you'd asked me two years ago i would have said comfortably 10 posts and at yc you know we're laughing at yc because we see companies with like 25 million dollar valuations 30 million dollar valuations i mean it's wild yeah well the old days of uh, not raising a lot of money off of like two dudes in a slideshow are behind us and we are now in this brave new world of 2019 in which things are all more expensive kind of across the globe, and especially here in startup land. Yeah. Um, we did not talk about the Lockheed Martin Venture Fund, though. I think we should bring that up as a point. Well, yeah, we were going to just chat a little bit about Disrupt. I mean, it, we're all here at TechCrunch Disrupt, which is our annual conference, uh, three days long in San Francisco, where we bring together sort of top VCs, top founders, um, just people that matter in tech. We've had actually had quite a lot of celebrities this year. Yeah, why is yeah, that? Yeah, so we had, we had uh, Will Smith. Um, Ashton Kutcher is going to be here. Um, Maisie Williams, Ma Game Maisie of Williams was here. Uh, oh, uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt was here yesterday. Yep. So I don't know why we had so many, but they're just or maybe celebrities are increasingly active in, in tech. I don't know. After the show, will you tell me who Jordan something Levitt is? I... <laughs> Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Okay, we talked about Joseph Gordon-Levitt on Equity once before, and you did this, and you said you didn't know, and I got. I've already forgotten. All right. Ten things I hate about you. Still haven't seen it. Five hundred days of summer. Nope. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, so apparently, pop culture is my is your sports, but for you me. know who Justin Yeah, Bellman of course. Is. Okay. Well, he's normal. He's a wonderful actor, and he just signed up to do a show on Apple TV or whatever, Apple Plus. Oh, I'm sure seven people will watch that. Um, All but right. anyway, uh, the Lockheed Martin thing. Um, we had a woman from Lockheed Martin speaking, and, and she she said they have a 200 million dollar venture fund, which I did not know that. Did you know that? Who was that? Who said that? I don't know. She she leads up something in uh, space research. I don't yeah. know. She's probably like the <clears throat> COO, someone very important. Yeah. Lockheed Martin. And she just mentioned they had a venture fund. And I just oh, had Lockheed. never... Oh, Lockheed, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Lockheed Mark, Martin, yeah. I had no idea. I didn't know CBC funds could be so large and still fly under our radar and not kind of come up often enough to yeah. be known by us. Yeah. I mean, we all know GV and Capital G and the kind of the, the technology-based ones, but defense tech is... It's big know? money, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that was interesting. But um, you guys have been going to Disrupt for a lot longer than I have, right? Well, how many times have you been? I think I've been going to Disrupt since the beginning. This is no question the biggest Disrupt I've ever been a part of. I thought the one you had at the pier a couple of years ago, I'm like, oh, this is probably as big as Disrupt can get. I was wrong. Yeah. This yeah. is amazing. I've been going to these since it was TechCrunch 40, I think, oh, way, 40. way wow. back in the day. I got a student pass when I was in like, high school, and I was crashing on my sister's couch. And uh, so I've been going to these forever. Yeah. It's, That's I awesome. don't know. It's fun to watch it grow up. But yeah. uh, let's dive into some early stage stuff. Yeah. Cool. So the first thing we're talking about uh, this week is Rhino, which is looking to kind of break up the, the, I don't know, the regime of how you pay for an apartment, which seems yeah. like a small thing until you move into a city and have to pay first month, last month, and a deposit. And they're attacking the deposit portion of that cake. Is that correct? Yeah. So they're turning, it sounds like they're, um, they're going to charge you a flat fee of like $3 per month. So instead of dropping, you know, $1,000 on your security deposit when you move into your apartment, you're only paying a small monthly fee. But the big question we have is, are they just keeping all that money and you're not going to get it back? I mean, the answer has to be yes, or the economics don't right. work out. Right. I mean, otherwise, or they're, or they're keeping a small cut of that overall fee, and they are still helping you by um, allowing you to forego actually dropping all that money when you move in. And moving is incredibly expensive, especially in a city like San Francisco, where, where rents are, you know just ridiculously high. Totally, but we buried the lead, or I buried the lead. They just raised a $21 yeah. million dollar Series A. So yeah. if I had brought up this idea to you, Charles, and said, hey, 
I got this cool idea. We're going to get away and we're going to do away with security deposits. You would be like, yeah, I'm really busy. But then this company goes out <laughs> and raises a $21 million Series A. So the problem must be showing some traction in terms of how they're approaching it. Um, and millennials are renting longer than previous generations. So It's interesting. We've seen a lot of companies in the last six months that are focused on the financial needs of renters. With really for the reason that you mentioned, Alex, which is that millennials in general are pushing off home ownership till later in life. They're still making plenty of money. And we were looking at it, it can cost you five or six thousand dollars to move into a new apartment in a city like it's San Francisco. It's wild. Yeah. It's crazy. And a lot of people are like, hey, I could finance that over twelve or eighteen months. I can't give you six thousand dollars right now. And if you think about the landlord, really what you want is you want to make sure that and I'm not an investor in the company, but what you really want is you want some assurance that if that person leaves early or damages the unit that you have some recourse. So it's actually kind of a cool financial instrument because you would think most of the risk is actually back end loaded. At the time the person moves out, did they punch a hole in the wall? Did they do some, yeah. some damage to the unit? And you would think if you could collect all of that money plus a premium, it ought to be relatively low risk as long as people don't totally destroy the apartment or they don't disappear. So is this more of an insurance product then? Are we kind of taking security deposits and turning them into an insurance system? That's, I mean, it's a regular payment. That's way less than the possible cost if you do destroy yeah. the place, distribute it across a large base. Yeah. It feels like insurance to me. I, yeah, I mean, that's what I, I mean, I, they didn't pitch me, so I don't know all the ins and outs of the business. Mm -hmm. But like my sense is that what they're really doing is, hey, you have this one really large one-time payment. I wonder what it does to incentives, like all the classic insurance questions yeah. around moral hazard and like, risk sharing, but I think it's kind of a clever idea to take this really big lump sum payment and make it something that people can finance. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly they're labeling themselves as an InsurTech startup. And I think we've seen a lot um, of companies trying to reinvent home ownership. So I'm not surprised to see more going on with renters because right. obviously that's a huge market as well. Um, Zero Down, which that one company that came out of YC with like a $60 million valuation was, was uh, eliminating the down payment process of buying a home, which for people in San Francisco who are even the tech rich um, can, according to the zero down pitch that they had given me, can have a hard time buying a house too. And so they're helping that, that demographic. Yeah. I've seen all their billboards in the city <laughs> advertising this. And I'm like, I still am in a place where that's a standard and, yeah. and functional bit of advertising. It's time to go. I and yeah, well, just... and SF, I think Bay Area is the only place that zero down is doing anything. Like that's, yeah. that is their sole market right now. So they're really doubling down probably with those billboards as is. Uh, I mean, not to, be, not to be kind of unkind, but I'm curious what their recession risk is. If the market falls apart, yeah. does that dry up demand for their service relatively sharply and quickly? I think, the, I think the risk for a lot of these models is we don't know what the underwriting criteria look like in moments of stress. And I think there's a lot of things both on the consumer and the corporate side where people are extending credit to people who historically haven't had much credit and in a low employment, uh, low interest rate, hot market that the actuarial models look really great. Who knows what happens when things snap back? Well, think about this. Right now, we're at a, a very high point. Stock market is still relatively highly valued. Tons of venture dollars around. Interest rates are going back down. And we're seeing this build. But recall like back when Lending Club was kind of blowing up, we were in a very different economic climate. People were trying to get rid of debt. And so I think that the financial tooling that we build is pretty much predicated on the current market fundamentals. Right. And Lending Club has not done great in the current economy. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if there'll be an inversion when things eventually, as they always do, fall apart. Yeah, I mean, I think betting on San Francisco housing is such a weird thing, right? Every year you say, this has to be the top. It cannot possibly become more expensive to live here. I hope and, not. And, and every year it feels like it does. Should we move on to our next Let's startup? Okay, so we're going to talk about Knowable, which is an interesting company uh, that raised a $3.75 million seed round this week from Andreessen Horowitz, um, Initialized Capital, and some other, some other folks. Yeah. Um, it's an audio startup. So it's, it's not a podcasting startup, even though it is a podcasting startup. It's more of an audio class. Yeah, so they're, they're providing um, audio to help you learn. <laughs> it's a podcast. It's kind they're, of like, mas it sounded like master class for audio to yeah, me. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So it sounded like educational podcasting. Yeah. But it's, um, for some reason, they don't want to be branded as such. I'm not quite sure why they don't want to, but they're calling it luxury audio, or Josh Constein. TechCrunch reporter, at least, did refer to it as luxury audio. So it's $100 per class. Per class. Yeah. Wow, that's... It's not cheap. Yeah, that's expensive. Would you pay $100 for an audio class? I don't think I would. But I'm also not an audible audiobooks person. I'm a digital Fair. books person, but not an audiobooks person. I do pay for audio. I pay for the service called Autumn, 
which will read you New Yorker, Atlantic. It'll read okay. you. Uh. It'll read you. Our, I'm an, I'm a small investor in the company too, but it'll read you long form print articles. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's certainly an opportunity, and there will be people that really like this. I mean, with the as AirPods have become more popular, I think there's just a lot more short form audio that's mm -hmm. that's also grown in popularity, and of course. People love podcasts as a scene with um, the, the steep rise in popularity of podcasts. Which surprised me because I never thought podcasting would break out of being a niche product. So I'm kind of hesitant to look at Knowable and say this won't work because there may be enough people out there who really prefer to be I mean, auditory listeners. Yeah. The word. Yeah. yeah, I don't think it's a bad idea at all, but I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense that they are so anti-labeling themselves as a podcast company because yeah. I guess... I would love to have them explain what the difference is between short form audio and podcasting. I guess I don't fully... I think it's a pricing thing. If yes. you say, we are a podcast company, everyone goes, podcasts don't cost $100, so podcasts are free. they're master class for audio, right. pretty much. Right, like so they, they want to be put into a different bucket so you don't mentally put them in a price category and then walk away. But we were talking um, before, kind of going through the, the, uh, the agenda, and we were surprised it wasn't a subscription product. Why not pay five bucks a month yeah. for this or three? I had, I had the same impression. I was like, oh, this feels like the kind of thing you would pay for, like a Netflix or a master class, and you could listen to all these different... I imagine, though, from a content production model, it's easier if you're commissioning content to say, hey, this class, <clears throat> people are paying by the class. I would imagine the conversation with the content producer is a lot easier if it's like, hey, you're going to make money off of your class and your ability to promote it and people's interest in buying it versus you're part of this catalog and you're going to get this revenue share. I, I kind of get it. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I also wonder, they currently only have, I think, a six courses live because this is, a, of course, a very new product. I do wonder, say, when they have 100 or 50 even, maybe then it becomes subscription-based yeah. and there's a library. I mean, at this point, you couldn't really charge a $100 subscription to a, a, a catalog of six yeah. classes, right? No, it's not nearly enough. Even if they do have Alexis Sohanian, who's very well-known and an investor in the company right. yeah. making content for them, smart. Yep. But that's probably not enough of a draw for actually to give me to pay for it on a recurring basis. So hopefully the pricing works. But Andreessen put money into this. Yeah. I think Andreessen put money into Substack. Yeah. And yeah. so they are putting capital into uh, kind of niche and new media-ish companies in a way that I have to say I think is really cool. I love Substack. This is neat. Yep. Yeah, I think it's cool too. I wonder, so these are uh, two different partners led the deals, one in Substack, one in um, Knowable. Do you think that the firm has some thesis around this or these are just kind of coincidental? I think they're just looking around at the world and saying this idea that consumers won't pay for content that they value is just no longer valid, no yep. longer a valid thesis. And then the question is, if consumers are willing to pay for content, who's likely to win the war? Is it going to be the ad-supported legacy businesses pivoting into subscription or direct monetization? Or is it more likely to be a new entrant in some of these categories? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a, I mean, that's what TC is doing. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, and so far, so good on the TC front, but I think yeah. a lot of publications are going to struggle with that. I don't think it's gone as well for some older pubs as it has for some pubs that have more of a focus like TC does. That's right. And it's our less general market. Like HuffPo, I don't see pursuing a paywall, for example. Yeah. And they actually, I think, had layoffs today, so it's kind of a sad move. Yeah, I mean, it's tough out there, and it's great to see new experience, experiments <laughs> like this. Um, but I think for now, this is a pretty half-baked product, although VCs is good for them for getting in early. It could turn right. into like this major, major uh, media platform. We have no idea. Yeah, yeah I like it. Uh, but let's move on to um, something that was confusing, I think. So we have a, a yeah. water purification subscription company. Uh, <laughs> so I'll tell you what, I'll take a crack at explaining yeah, this and please. we can all figure out what it is. Thank you. <laughs> so so uh, you all, we all live at home, I think, and we all drink water sometimes and you want to have good water to drink and uh, some places don't have good water. So if you have money, you can give them $49 to install a thing in your house to clean your water and then pay them $29 a month to send you replacement filters. Um, that feels very expensive, and I don't know why this has to be a subscription product. That's my take. I don't know really much about any of this. Like, I don't know how much a water filter costs on its own, so it's kind of tough to even... Like a Brita, kind of put in your... Yeah. Or a Soma, or like any of these water filters. Yeah. I was just like, isn't this a solved problem you get a pitcher with a filter and you put right. water in it and, and then eventually you get a new one when yeah. you scratch that one do you even need multiple per month or do no. they just send you one per month see there's many i have many questions so they made they raised a million dollars so. they raised a million dollars um and i think from mission gate and columbus holdings and maybe again this is one of those things that we can't quite see the full picture of but this also feels a bit to me like the edge or the end of d to c like, we've now d 2 would everything, yeah. and now we are down to <laughs> water filters. My favorite thing about the script for this is it says, 
this company uses the reverse osmosis method. Are we supposed to know what that means? <laughs> yeah, it's because it's, it's <laughs> no, I, if you're a water nerd, yeah. In, in defense of who wrote that down, and we're not going to name names, but it was Chris Gates. <laughs> um, the, the, it's how a lot of, I think, camp filters work. You push water through a, a, a set of filters, and yep. then it kind of, the stuff gets stuck and the water goes through. I used to do a lot of camping, so that's how I know that. Yep. Uh, but it's a relatively standard process. All right, showing off a little bit. That's okay. not showing off. That's admitting that I used to be stuck in the woods for weeks on end. <laughs> um, shall we talk about YC for a second? Yeah. All right. So one thing that we think was interesting about the, the market as a whole is that some early bets are now old enough to be uh, nigh fully mature. And one thing that we keep track of here in Silicon Valley more than we probably should is Y Combinator. Yep. Fascinating and fast moving and sets a lot of precedent. Uh, there's a new kind of leader on the YC winner's board, for lack of a better term, and it's Stripe, uh, which is now worth, I believe, Kate, $35 billion. $35 billion as of what? A couple weeks ago. Couple weeks they raised ago. a big round. Yeah. $250 million. They're now ahead of Airbnb, which is worth $30.5 uh, But, of course, they're going to eventually do a direct listing, which we'll talk about. But I was surprised to see Stripe and Airbnb. I didn't know they were going to be the leading two from uh, the YC universe. Who did you think would be the leading? I don't know. I, I don't think I had a company in mind. I just, I wouldn't have, that wouldn't have been my first Thought like, oh yeah, YC, of course, Stripe is leading. Yeah. Uh, but I guess it's a testament to their success. I mean, they built a platform, for lack of a better term, that brings this ability to everyone else, like Twilio. Yeah. But they're just still private, and I wish they would go public so I can see their numbers. I'm, I'm tired of waiting. What was crazy, they had that pie chart at the bottom. Yeah. 50% of that list is B2B companies. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, we talk a lot on this show about how YC is becoming a SaaS incubator of sorts, uh, and it's interesting to see the data actually show that. Um, another interesting piece of data from that list that YC dropped yesterday, I think, 71% um, of those companies are based in the Bay Area, 63% are based in SF. Yeah. Of the top 101 most valuable, right? Yes, I okay, believe. So, so, uh, or, I don't know, actually. I think of the top 101 companies, right. 63, okay, okay. so uh, just under two-thirds are based But I mean, do SF. you think that number varies greatly if you look at the entire population of graduates? Well, if we knew the difference in numbers, we could talk about the difference in graduation rates and the ability to generate wealth. But I'm going back in time in my brain, and I think Michael Seibel said it was roughly about that for the entire company. Yeah. But I mean, it just goes to show that I, I, I guess I'm not surprised by it. Do you encourage your companies to set up camp in SF? So it's really interesting. We have companies in four countries and I think 19 or 20 states. Oh, wow. We have some people who are not in the Bay Area, and it's a cost advantage. Every time they come to San Francisco for a week, they go, I got a month's worth of work done in a week. Yeah. I, went, I met so many people. I learned so many things. I went and met somebody on Monday, and on Wednesday, they introduced me to their friend who could solve this problem. And then on Wednesday, that person introduced me to someone. On Friday, when can I come back? And it really is this like really unique incubator. We see the same thing in our portfolio. In our portfolio, the San Francisco-based companies, three of our four top performing companies from Fund One are based in San Francisco. So 75% 75 of your best of our, performers. Mm -hmm. And are they based there when you fund them, or do they often move here? After they were they all funding? three of those started life in San Francisco, and I expect them to finish life in San Francisco as well. I mean, we talk a lot about Utah and other startup scenes that are doing well. And to be clear, a lot of places in the US and internationally have achieved um, critical mass. Yeah. But I mean, there's still critical -er mass. Yeah. I mean, we're sitting here in the middle of San Francisco, literally in Soma right now, so. We have the most volatility in our San Francisco portfolio though, and I think it's because of the, the cost of operating here is this crucible. And if you can't recruit and you can't grow. The cost of operating here will eat you alive and you won't live for very long. Yeah. If you can do those things, you have almost a limitless talent pool. And so for the very best companies, it's probably the best place to be because you can afford it. But if you're a middle tier company, then following your argument, you will struggle more here than you might have in, say, Columbus. Yeah, Absolutely. there's just conflicting narratives right now because I think more and more people are saying, leave San Francisco, it's too expensive. You can set up your company anywhere. You can be remote. You don't need a headquarters, whatever it is. And then yet, you see these data points of like, oh, well, actually, most of the top performing companies are based here. Yeah. Yeah. And this whole based here thing is getting complicated. Does that mean where management is? Does that right. mean where 50.01% of the employees are? I mean, I think it was interesting. Stripe's latest remote, the latest sort of field office was remote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, like, at what point does Stripe not, should Stripe not be considered a San Francisco company based on employee head? I don't think yeah. we have a vocabulary to talk about. San Francisco yeah. headquartered companies where many, many of the employees are not here. 
I think this also goes back to GitLab, which I believe yeah. is fully distributed as a company. And so they wouldn't have an HQ location. They're just kind of like dissolved among the planet. Yeah, there were four companies on the, the YC Top 101 list that were fully remote. Wow. Don't ask me what they are because I forgot. Which were they? <laughs> Uh, but we do, sorry, we do, <laughs> we do have some at the bottom here we want to talk about that had reached this uh, kind of mythical top 100 list very, very quickly. Which companies were those? Uh, the ones that reached the list really quickly? Sorry, I didn't. Yeah, uh, the ones that are going fast that are new to the yeah, list. Yeah, so Zero Down, which we mentioned already. Yep. Grin, which is the scooter company, Latin American yep. scooter company. Um, Brex, which we all know. We don't yeah. need to <laughs> dive in there. Um, and then Atrium, which is the Justin Kahn founded uh, legal startup. Oh, right, 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 right. When did that launch? So, actually, that one surprised me, too, but apparently it was a 2018. Really? Yeah, 18 months. Isn't that insane? Yeah. What's it worth now? I don't know. A, a lot. But, I mean, I more than a billion dollars. I don't Jeez. know. Yeah, I mean, it's worth something. Yeah. All right, well, good, to the, good for them. And uh, mm -hmm. I do love where we are in the market right now. Things go so fast. There's no waiting around for results. It's just capital so in, and then you really hope it grows fast. It makes our job very not boring. <laughs> I don't know how it makes you feel, but... Terrified. Terrified. Also, probably it's hard like to keep up. It's really hard to keep up. Okay, we're going to talk about um, something that we've been riffing on off and on for a little bit, especially around the time that Slack uh, didn't go public per se, but started to trade publicly, uh, which is direct listings. And we now know, unsurprisingly to some degree, that Airbnb is going to pursue a direct listing. So, first of all, Charles, impressions about that? Like, do you think it's the smart move? Like, what do you feel about that idea? I, I do. I'm surprised. You know, it's one of those. I, this feels like one of those cases where things change really quickly all of a sudden. And I think this momentum around direct list, I remember when Spotify and people yeah. said, oh, you know, all the arguments that I think were compelling before I find less compelling, oh, you can only do this if you're a brand that people recognize. I don't right. know if I buy that argument anymore. And I've, I'm surprised. It seems to have awoken a set of my peers in venture who have lots of IPOs and deal with this problem on a regular basis, to become really agitated and motivated about this sort of IPO pop phenomenon. And I would, I mean, finance, I think, is usually a very conservative industry. Very. And I think there's just been this awakening both on the side of, like, investors and on founders that, like, the old way of doing this doesn't serve companies very well. Did you go to the conference this week that Bill Gurley and I did friends... did not go, but I followed it on Twitter, and I had some friends who went, and there was a lot of energy and enthusiasm in that room from what I heard. Yeah, so I talked to Megan Quinn, who went, and I mean, I asked her how it was, and she was just kind of like, oh, it was exactly how you would have imagined it to be, and I was like, <laughs> oh, I don't really know what it was like. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it, Bill Gurley was kind of the one who, seems like he was the one who sort of th threw yes. it together. Um, had a lot of people there, and it seemed like it's interesting to see how much this conversation has developed so quickly this last few months. Because when Spotify did this, it certainly was not the conversations were not like this, and there were not um, you know VCs preaching about how this is the future. It seems like this has been the summer of direct listings and sort of preaching about um, the possibility and impact that they can have. So here's my thought about the narrative that was being built. Because there were a number of IPOs this year that priced maybe even higher than we expected them to and then saw an immediately strong return, which prompted cries of money left on the table. We've also seen the other side of that with mm -hmm. Smile Direct Club and Peloton, which priced very, very aggressively, you might say, generating a lot of capital in for their business and then saw their share prices decline. So the other side of this. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if the direct listing furor is more an argument against overly conservative pricing as opposed to saying that the IPO mechanic itself is broken yeah. more that the implementation thereof is bad and therefore it's the banker's fault, which I will never say no to. But it, to me, it might be the wrong solution, perhaps. I just try to take myself back. I remember when Google did their IPO, everyone's like, oh, the old IPO process is broken. We're ushering in a whole, and, and yeah. it didn't. Have you ever heard about another reverse Dutch auction <laughs> since Google's? No, I had to learn that for Google and I've never forgotten it, but I can't recall anyone else trying to do that ever again. Well, I just want to, uh, give a brief rant, but I feel like a lot of the, um, there is some criticism over how the press covers IPOs. And it's, it's like, uh, I think VCs get frustrated when we cover pops and we make it seem like um, those are a positive marketing event. And I, I don't think that that's what we're doing. I mean, I'm biased because I'm a reporter, but I think we cover pops because they are a news event. And I don't think, at least in my coverage of pops, I'm saying, oh my gosh, this company is going to succeed. Wall Street loves them. I mean, we're covering it. How, I mean, how do you, you, you do that too. And you, you also cover pops and you also cover um, the opposite. Yeah, but I cover extreme price movements in the value of newly public companies. Right. They reflect what we can learn about the private, com private market. If, if a company went public a week ago and now it goes up 30% in one day, I'm going to notice. I also so, think yeah. like we've never in recent memory had 
pub private companies raise this much money and, raise, and remain private for this long. So it's not surprising to me that we're getting to a period where there's wildly divergent views on these companies between private market investors who by and large can only invest in tech companies. They have like yeah. a very narrow sliver. So it's easy to see how if you can only sort of eat steak, like you're going to overpay a little bit versus the market <laughs> which can sell tech and Good. buy industrials or sell tech right. and buy financials. And so I think I hope this is like a good process that kind of starts to rationalize the difference between the way public market investors think about this stuff and the way that private market investors do. I want to go back to, I forget which guest it was, but I said, you know, you can't raise capital in direct listing. Some companies aren't a good fit for that because they actually need the money. And they said, well, you just raise $100 million in a private round, then do a direct listing and decouple the mechanic. Um, I just want to say that we talk a lot in general about things changing in the macro picture. If the macro picture changes and private dollars become harder to find, traditional IPOs will look better in those moments as an actual fundraising mechanism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, we'll see. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw that in the next three years. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to unpack, and we'll continue talking about this for months to come. I, I think this is only going to become a larger conversation in tech, Silicon Valley at large. Yeah. Um, but before we go, uh, we can't do equity this summer slash early fall <laughs> without talking about the glorious we company because they keep doing things and we can't dodge them. So this True. week's we story, Kate, what's going on? So everyone knows Adam Newman stepped down about two weeks ago now and a lot of shit's been happening. But um, the latest is that WeWork is trying to sell off uh, at least five of its acquisitions. So these are startups the company had acquired not too long ago, some of these. Yeah. No, so Space IQ, which is going to be let go, was acquired in July of 2019, which was about 48 <laughs> minutes ago. Uh, Team, which is T-E-E-M, it was September 18. Conductor, March 18. Uh, and Managed by Q was April of this year. And of course, Meetup was back in November 2017. So if you're one of these companies, what are you thinking right now if you're owned by WeWork? It's unclear to me how thoughtful or organized <clears throat> this disposition process is going to be because if they're going to sell it, they need to find a buyer on the other end. And who True. is that buyer? What are they going to pay? Is it going to be someone who has any interest whatsoever in continuing with that product? And to me, the other question is, what happened to these companies once they got absorbed by WeWork? Presumably, they lost their independent product development roadmaps or service. So I have no idea what any of those companies look like as purchasable assets. Can I touch on that? Because yeah. your argument is very, very good. If we're assuming that the acquiring company had a plan and had <laughs> internal <laughs> operations that worked and could take on a new business and either use it for parts or invest in the product roadmap and, and build it into its own. But we're talking about WeWork. So maybe... <laughs> They didn't do any of that, and these are still discrete entities with their own stuff, and they can be sold off uh, in bytes. I mean, I guess if like, they have to try, right? Like, they ha there might, they, you know, putting them up for sale and selling them are two really different things. It's true. I want to point out, though, that we joke, but these are people. Yeah. And we, we don't right. want anything. Right, no, we want anything... things to work out for them, of course. Right. We joke about WeWork's mistakes, but to be clear, we're not yeah. laughing at what people will go through in the sale, and we don't want to make, make light of that, especially because uh, there was some news you just put out, we put out, actually. Yeah, um, I mean, it just sounds like there's going to be massive layoffs yeah. at WeWork. So the, essentially just the news is that earlier reports are true and the company is sort of preparing to announce those and, and we'll find out soon who, who's being impacted yeah. by those cuts. Okay, do you know how, how big of layoffs we're talking about? Well, earlier reports said as many as 5,000 people, which is about one third of WeWork. Um, and we don't know exact numbers yet, but it's going to be large. I mean, they're working with bankers to sort of uh, cut, costs, cut costs following Adam Newman's sort of crazy uh, management Excesses, strategy yeah. in which, yes, he spent a lot of money and the company was burning cash so fast. So now they're trying to sort of hone in on where can we cut, where can we save money? I mean, they have real cash needs. I mean, like yeah. in the media, I mean, I just feel bad. I was a skeptic of WeWork in the beginning and I think I've netted out that WeWork, the product is an amazing innovation for small companies. WeWork, the company has issues. I would say it's also an amazing innovation for financial like, chicanery. Like, like they did amazing things with money. Mm -hmm. They managed to keep getting more and more capital in larger chunks as they went along to do more and more crazy things. Yeah. It's an impressive story. It's also yeah, a cautionary and, tale. And like we said before we taped, I mean, this is sort of going to be one of the cautionary tales of Silicon Valley companies. I know we work as not a Silicon Valley company, technically in New York, but the same of the ages. You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you on that. But uh, we should stop. Time we should, to go. We're a little yeah. bit over time. Thank you for coming on yet Thank again. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll have you on more often than every 26 months. So we'll probably see you again in about a year. Thank, Thank you, Charles. You. Thanks.